Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard, along with Tracy. Hazard? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and we're going to talk 3D manufacturing sustainability today. And I just, this is a topic. So on the one hand, we talk about sustainability as, you know, green. Like you think about the green aspect of things, you know, going green. And on the other hand, though, sustainability is also like, sustainability of supply chain and your manufacturing process. And there's a lot of other things that comply to that. Um, there's carbonization that matters. So like, or decarbonization where we're taking and making it more efficient to truck things or not truck things for a change or not, you know, car things across an ocean. Right. So any of those things that we can change in the process and, you know, you and I have been working in this a really long time. So this is not new to us. This is probably our entire career. There's always been a little bit of sustainability edge. It's always been hard because you're balancing, like, is it the right time? Is economics there? Or is it not quite yet? And I'm a fan of making baby steps, right? It doesn't matter as long as we're making an improvement over the last time we made a part or we made a design. If we can make some kind of sustainability improvement, then we, we've done something good for the world. Well, not only that, Tracy, but, you know, at times you have to deal with what the market is going to accept in right. a product. And uh, we're going to hear with our interview in this episode that there are some unique opportunities being presented in our world today that may help make some of these things even more acceptable sooner than we thought. Right. And I, yeah. And as you're saying that, Tom, it's just like, you know, when we start to mix the variables so that all of a sudden some things pop up as givens that we said, these are non-negotiable in manufacturing, so you can't change this or in design, you say you can't engineering, you can't change this. And all of a sudden, you know, the environment negotiates with you or the, or the economy negotiates with you, right? All of a sudden things open up and um, manufacturing is not usually open to that. I can just tell you that right now. They like to do the same thing every single time. And that's why Nicholas Smith, our guest today, is such so eye-opening. Like he's just, it's like wonderful eye-opening view of 3D manufacturing and sustainability at that rate. And so he's the director of operations for HP in the graphics and 3D printing department, although he's working in multiple divisions over, over his time. He's from the UK originally, um, but he spent 30 years based in Singapore working with HP. And um, he's responsible for the manufacturing of HP's portfolio of 3D multi-jet fusion and the large format printers. Um, he's had experience in automation and manufacturing scanners. So he's been around the company for a while and has a broader view of their supply chain and their process and their equipment and everything that they do. And um, they make printers in China, Malaysia, and Singapore, which is really interesting. So um, he's going to talk a little bit about that. And, you know, I really enjoyed getting to speak with him, and I think you will enjoy it too. We have, on WTFFF, we have never really had anybody on as a guest with quite his perspective no so it, it was really eye-opening and refreshing and i really hope you enjoy it so let's go to that interview and, and we'll be back with for a little discussion yeah, let's hear from nicholas smith nicholas thanks so much for joining us and it's wonderful to talk across the ocean well thanks for having me i'm i'm happy to be here and hope you're both doing well we are. Thank you. You know, this is one of my, sustainability is one of my favorite subjects, whether I'm talking about sustainability of like making a sustainable business, right? A sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. Or I used to write a column, I used to write uh, blogs really early on. I was a really early blogger writing columns on easygoing green. And I was talking about sustainability in furniture industry and, and woods and all kinds of things. And I would write all these articles and no one read them but my dad. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and now it's like, it's, it's become common part of almost every business discussion. And I'm so glad it's there, but it's core to what you're doing at HP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and it seems uh, even more important now in the current times we're having with this uh, coronavirus epidemic, the, the increased focus on doing things the right way, doing things in a way which is local as opposed to central um, and allowing uh, manufacturing to take place near where it needs to be done, I think has reached a, a new level of importance um, for, for many reasons. Well, isn't that really becoming apparent 
to all of us around the world as there's been really a pause in a lot of manufacturing, a pause in a lot of travel, and the atmosphere is benefiting tremendously. I think we saw it in China first when you know they had COVID-19 mm-hmm. impact and factories mm-hmm. shut down. So uh, it was such a long period, of course, from Chinese New Year all the way through. So they had, you know, so we, we saw some satellite images of like what the earth was looking like. And there was such clearing over over the oceans between California and, and Asia. And that was amazing, right, to see. So we now realize, wow, we can do it. We can make an impact. Yes. And, you know, that was a combination of um, supply shock uh, initially in China and then demand shock as it moved to the rest of the world. And so uh, that has definitely shown us that we can do better. Hopefully we can do better in better times as well. So it's definitely shown us a potential for the future. Yeah, I think it shows us the opportunity. That's exactly what we were talking about the other day. So yeah. And I love the idea of decentralization, but uh, you know, some things are really challenging. So, you know, we've heard about how many parts are in your HP printers and like, you know, just thinking about that, like there's some amount of complexity to things that do have to be more centralized and controlled and then distributed around the world. And I know that you're, you're doing that in, in China, Malaysia, Singapore right now. So you have a little bit of distribution, but are, are you starting to think that maybe it, maybe that's could be different? I, I think so, yes. Uh, I think COVID has uh, maybe accelerated some of the discussions that folks are having. And the supply chain we have today is exactly what the economics of the current times demanded, which is producing really things in a really economic, really efficient way. So you can buy a $5 t-shirt, right? But maybe uh, these things do need to change and we need to reshape We need to reshape uh, what we're doing. So I think HP, along with many companies, is having a serious look at how we balance all the various competing factors because people are still going to want high-quality products. People are still going to want people products at low cost. Uh, If you duplicate manufacturing in many different places, you lose economies of scale. And so uh, I I think 3D is going to have an increasing role in maybe allowing core vanilla products to be made in one location and then value added at local locations and i think it's the mix we always like that idea yeah i think yeah so you could have high we always call them hybrid that was our ideal was that there was always this like 3d print hybrid model maybe going on where maybe you had base products that 3d print products added onto or they were customized and and I, i i think the reason hp is so enthusiastic about 3d is because this transformation from analog to digital is what we've seen in 2D printing for the last 30 years. Maybe, I, I, maybe an example. I don't know if, you've, if you have noticed a couple of years ago, there was a share a Coke with campaign by Coca-Cola. Mm. And you would go into 7-Eleven and you'd find share a Coke with Tom, share a Coke with Tracy on the Coke bottles. Now right, those- I remember. N- those labels, and that is a campaign that went all around the world, those labels, you didn't notice, had been printed with two different technologies. The wraparound mm. parts of the label, which are always standard, because it tells you how much good is in a can of Coke, in, in a bottle of Coke, where it's made, what the refund is in various states, that doesn't change. That was printed on analog conventional offset printing technology. The middle part of the label that faces the customer, which has the the curvy line for Coke and has your name on, was printed digitally at two separate locations. Mm -hmm. Now to enable that, and I look carefully at these levels, you can't see the join. And that's because the quality of the 2D print was the same as the quality of the traditional print. The red Coke color was the same as the red Coke color printed um, by analog means. And that's what's important to be able to allow this kind of hybrid stuff where, so quality is absolutely critical to being able to do this kind of thing. We so agree. (laughs) Quality is critical. And actually, I mean, you know, uh, Tracy has particular experience in colors, materials, and finishes. and, And I know just from seeing that, uh, you know, a sort of over her shoulder, if you will, that's not an easy thing to coordinate. Oh, it's getting very those difficult. 
colors to be the actual same. And then, like you said, the seamlessness of the different kind of printing. That must yeah. have been quite a challenge. Yeah, it's not as simple as those people think out there that you can just go, well, here's my CMYK or here's my, you know, or here's my Pantone color, right? Yeah. And then they just work in two different types of medium. They don't. Absolutely. I, and usually for, for that kind of color of fidelity, you have to go away from process color, which is a CMYK dots, to a spot color. And now the spot colors we're able to get with our digital printing process are so accurate that I was told that the standard for Coke Red is now the digital print standard, not the analog standard, because it was so faithful and so reproducible, we moved to that. So that is a sign that things are transforming. And it does take quite a while for digital to become as good as that. You have to have... Well, I think. I think Tiffany Blue is on its way next now. <laughs> and, they, and they're, they're going to be slow to adopt that because they've been hiding their formula from the colorists out there who've been trying to match it perfectly. So yes. they're going to be next, though. So. Yes. Yes. So, well, you know, I, this is so, I think this is, you know, really looking at 3D as that same model that you were talking mm. about in 2D. That's a really interesting concept because it does have to go through this hybrid stage before it can go into full production because we have to see this sort of like you say there are parts and things that we just can't make in 3d today materials we just can't use yet yes the gamut of materials has to get bigger because when you buy most products like a, a printer they come with fairly specialist engineered resins to get particular properties to give you the accuracy that you need or the fire retardants that you need or the strength that you need right and 3D is more limited at the moment. So we need to widen the gamut. We need to make the material properties better because depending on the technology you use, our 3D parts can be fairly brittle. They can be strong. It depends on exactly what technology you're going after, what the resin is. You have to have the, out, the throughput to be faster, to machine up time to be higher. And that's how you start to take over traditional means of manufacturing and be able to do that tipping point longer and longer and longer and longer. And be able to do that localized in other places when you have consistency from Precisely. machine to machine and material to material, so. Well, Precisely. And to me, that's the exciting future of 3D printing that I look forward to. And I hope we see a lot of advancements there still in our careers before we're done, you know, <laughs> in doing this. But it, it will happen for sure because it has happened in 2D. I mean, I'm an operations guy. Um, I'm not a futurist. I look backwards to see what has happened as a best predictor of what may happen in the 3D space. Well, and, and that's so good because so many in operations don't want anything to change, right? So it's good that you're forward thinking, right? <laughs> I, I mean, to me, the further away I can keep the R&D folks from my factory, the happier I am. <laughs> and you're because, talking to two R&D people yeah, here. So yeah, <laughs> we I know, know. I'm sorry, guys. But, you know, in, 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 in manufacturing operations, um, we bring calm to the chaos that is the creative process. And uh -huh. that, is, that is a necessity because when it transforms into something people are going to want to buy from a brand they trust, it has to be every piece the same. It has to deliver what it says on the label, and it must be every piece the same. And <laughs> there's a lot of creative folks out there and a lot of hobbyists, which is fantastic, using their uh, inexpensive 3D printers and using uh, fused filament, right? Um, that kind of thing. Um, but to make that scale, people have to trust what they're buying. And inevitably, it's either a brand or you have to become a brand for people to trust you enough to buy the product. Oh, I think well, you've been listening to our whole show because that's what we've been saying all along. So thank you. For, thank you for reinforcing well, that from an operation side. But to me, from a, a designer's perspective that uh, understands and respects and, and, and lives within the confines of manufacturing all the time, I'm very excited about the multi-jet fusion 3D manufacturing aspect because I understand there is tremendous consistency from one machine to the next that you might have in different parts of the world. Whereas with fused filament, there's always been so many variables, whether they're, you know, environmental variables or material quality variables and, you know, layer adhesion from one to the next that so many different variables that can make 
you know, even the same CAD file printed in one place or another, significantly different. Yes. And that's problematic. Yes. It, 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 is, it is a challenge, um, especially when technology is new, to get the same, um, to get the same quality repeatability from material properties from machine to machine from continent to continent, within the same machine from day to day, within the same machine from one part of the print area to the other part of the print area. This, this science, which is becoming engineering, is critical uh, to, to enabling that. Even when we look at uh, what our folks have been trying to do to support COVID with various bits and pieces, to support healthcare folks, when you want to, to, to deliver these items to healthcare workers, there's a regulatory framework that you have to go to um, where they want to see consistency. And you know, we can innovate, or maybe designers like you can innovate a hundred times faster than regulatory approvals can be sought. And this I think is a, is a big challenge for the future because how do you make, Tom, as you said, how do you make sure that the same part is the same part? Right? This is one of the big things that us manufacturing folks are obsessed about so that the product you buy, no matter where it's made, is the same. The last thing you want to have to do is rummage through and say, where was this made? Was it made on a Monday or was it made on a Friday? That kind of thing is what manufacturing must kill. Well, all manufacturing still has those same problems, right? Like you're always, that, well, you're always trying to remove out all the variables in the process. Yeah, because, so that's, because that is the beauty that we bring to complete the creative process, right? And yeah. to, to provide something that people want to buy, whether it's personalized and unique or whether it's the same as, as, as every other one on the shelf. So this, this consistency is, is really important. And we've seen it, I mean, even in, uh, you know, uh, this is a face mask adjuster, right? People have been printing yes. these all over. Um, I've, all I've printed one myself, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you have scouts in Canada, you have the Singapore National Library MakerBot community firing up their machines, and you have HP with that, you know, it's uh, super, super flexible, right? Wow. Um, all, 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 all firing things up, but for us to be able to donate these in, we've done, we've done it in China, in the US, in the UK, and now in Singapore, for us to be able to donate these, you have to go through an approval process because it's used in a, in a clinical setting, even though it's really no more than a hair, hair accessory, really. Um, yeah. but, but to be able well, to do that is, is quite is quite a complex task. And one of the things that does worry me is this consistency and the regulatory process to be able to get things through. It's really you know slow. what? It's always concerned us too. So yeah, we completely it's, understand that. It's very exciting to me what I'm seeing here on the video. And I, I just want to share for our listeners who are not looking at the video, you, you may want to go to the blog post at 3dstarpoint.com to see uh, this video clip, or maybe we'll take just a still image out of it or both. Yep. But to see what Nicholas is holding up and how flexible it is. And, and I, even through the video, I can see, wow, that's a very clean, fine made part. Right. Okay, so, uh, so this is a face mask adjuster. You put it behind your head to hold the uh, ear loops away because uh, pressure sores from long-term wearing a face mask are a real concern for people in a clinical environment. And the last thing you want is someone who is swabbing your nose to have Painful, a painful headache caused by prolonged uh, wearing of a mask. So this is uh, something important. And since I mentioned it, uh, nasal swabs. Oh, so, yes. yes. This is, we've been a big we've, topic of conversation we've been we, hearing lately. We have been hearing about this, but we haven't seen them yet. So, so. so you, they, they, I, I can give you the name. Of the, they, they are now available for sale in the U.S. It's a HP collaborative design. They've been through tests in Beth Israel, Deaconess Medical Center, uh, Harvey, uh, the Harvard Consortium. And they are now available because the, the, one of the big problems to mass testing now for COVID is the availability of nasal swaps. And you know, to, to get these through, yes. even in an accelerated time frame, uh, is not easy because obviously it's going, it's going into the body, right? Quite deep. And you mm -hmm. want to make sure yeah. that it meets, uh, is biocompatible, you can sterilize it, et cetera, et cetera. And Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital is in Boston, I believe. I happen <laughs> to know that because I'm originally from there. There and, you go. Uh, they always yes. sponsor the Boston Red Sox. That's oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, so, Nicholas, I have so, a question I just for wanna, you. I just oh, want to okay. clarify. So, you know, the, what we've been talking about right now may seem like it's off the sustainability to, uh, topic. And, and I want to clarify that for the listeners right now, because if we don't get to some amount of decentralization, 
then we're really not going to get to the decarbonization, which is such an essential and, and growth area that we, oh, we can be using, right? Yes. So the two things are tied here. So yes. that's why we wanted to have Nicholas talk about this, because we really wanted you to hear some of these factors that are going in, because it's not as easy as just flipping a switch and us, us changing the way everything works in manufacturing. It doesn't, it's not like that. No, it takes a lot of thought to to be to be able to use 3d effectively in products that we use today we have to be you have to really think carefully we, we've got to remember that the feedstock whether it's filament or powder is a lot more expensive than resin and to be able to 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 adopt 3d uh, better and to get the benefits we want for sustainability we've got to bear in mind the economics of it as well and those have to scale and it won't scale unless we are thoughtful. So if you take a design and you just transform it into 3D, that's maybe nice. You can maybe do it remotely, but it's going to be more expensive than the part made with conventional technology. Now, you can take that design and hollow out parts of it to make it lighter. That's better, right? You can use 3D to combine several pieces together. That's better. But the holy grail is where you go to this kind of topological design where it looks like it's fallen off of a spaceship but yet has the same anchor points as, and the same strength that's needed. And we've seen when you do that, you can get parts that are 95% lower carbon footprint, 93% lighter. But they're only wow. today 50% cheaper because the feedstock is more expensive. But the key there is to oh. still make sure that they're con consumer or in industry acceptable, right, at the end of the day. So, you know, that's that's really our job as designers is to now make that work. Exactly. Right? And we're, we're talking about parts typically that may be inside the machine rather than yeah. uh, parts on, on the surface. But um, that kind of thing is, is really critical to enable the success. And to do that, people have to unlearn almost everything they learned when they did their engineering degrees. <laughs> and our, their design degrees. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Because our, des our designs today are constrained by how it's going to be produced. And that right. means holes you can drill from the top. It means slots you can machine from. And we have to unlearn that to unlock right. possibilities. Yeah. There's a new set of rules, or I would actually prefer to say some new opportunities. Yes. <laughs> Right. Yes. Now, I have a question for you. I've been, uh, you know, I've actually been looking forward to speaking with you because I know you have this knowledge from more of the, the manufacturing production side of mm -hmm. things, and we rarely get to talk to somebody like you. Um, we, we, it's easy for people to understand the sustainability improvements of distributed manufacturing, you know, I need to ship things and, and use more fuel. That's clear. You can make things differently like you just said that are hollowed out or have different kind of you know maybe uh cellular or honeycomb structure within them and reduce the amount of material but what can you share with us about the materials themselves that the multi-jet fusion technology prints with are those raw materials do they have a big carbon impact and and how does it compare to other conventional materials well, I, I, I think the, the stuff we use, you have PA12, PA11, uh, you know, nylon, basically. We're starting to work with uh, um, elastomers. We will be working with metals. Uh, we, have some, we have some of that business running now. Wow. Um, you can buy parts from our technology from a couple of companies, um, which is kind of a pilot manufacturing activity for us to understand the space better. And we've already announced Metal Jet Fusion as, the, as, a, as a future platform to be serious about the manufacturing space, which is what HP is, is really excited about. Um, well, I'm excited about metal, so that sounds like a lot of fun too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It's, uh, it's really pretty promising. So I think the, the materials we have, I think one of the advantages we have, and maybe it's uh, the Metal Jet Fusion technology as well, the parts are strong. They're as strong as if they had been molded in... Um, in uh, plastic injection mode. And as you can see from the, from the examples, actually, they're flexible, right? Um, right. So the material properties are, are extremely, uh, extremely helpful in some applications. And, you know, if you look at P, uh, PA11, PA12, they're basically nylon. They are as reusable, recyclable as any, uh, as, uh, as any nylon product would be. You can melt them and, and reuse them. Yeah. 
Well, that's fantastic. And of course, we know, well, or I should say, I mean, I know, Tracy knows, but I mean, anybody who understands the injection molding process knows how much actual waste material that goes goes into everyone that's printed. You always have all this material that gets pushed in on the way to the part, but does not become the part. Molded. What did I say? Printed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Yeah. I Printed misspoke. works. Yeah. Well, no, but, but ones that are injection molded, I meant. You know, you have material being pushed in on the way to the part that never becomes a part and has to yeah. be reground, and maybe it can be recycled. Right. So, and all the energy that goes into that. I mean, to me, yeah. I mean, obviously, I've been a fan of 3D for ages. ages because we see the promise, but we really also saw the design challenges and other things as well in, in the acceptance in the marketplace. But, I, you know, things are starting to change, and, and that's been really beautiful to see over the last five years that we've been doing this show. Right. And, you know, there's just you, there's been a lot of real investment uh, that we've discovered as we've been doing this series with HP. And um, I heard that it's an $84 million uh HP NTU, which I don't know what NTU stands for, so hopefully you'll define that digital manufacturing corporate lab that you're that you're in in Singapore, yes. and that its goal is to democratize digital manufacturing on a global scale. Tell us some about it, whatever you can. We have established that lab because um, I th- I think one I've been in Singapore for more than thirty years. One of the good things about being in this country is that it has such it is so small. It has no momentum of its own. It has no significant internal market. So we have always had to respond really quickly to any global changes. So the inertia is very small. And recognizing the future is becoming digital and maybe not really understanding what all that may produce, uh, the government and HP has working with uh, Nanyang Technological University, NTU, uh, which is one of the, the <laughs> one of the leading kind of um, tech universities in Singapore has established this lab. They have a bunch of multi jet fusion printers to do more looks into applications, to do more looks into uh, when you print on powder, uh, what are the implications, right? Um, it's such a new technology that we ourselves are understanding more about it as we do each iteration and to have those research kind of programs and then look at areas uh, such as not just um, not just 3D printing, but associated with that designs, how you protect them, intellectual property, how you lock that down and what that means for piracy and, and this, these kinds of things, right? Because files, you can send them in an email, right? Uh, so how do you make sure that you can lock that down? Because if you buy an HP product or a product by, not, by another reputable company, and other companies do exist, right? How do you make sure that that is really from the right company? You can produce these deep fakes now where you have other people's faces, right? And it looks real. So how do you do that? Because as much as it has promised, it has promised for people to, to do rip-offs and do uh, irresponsible things to make a quick buck. So that's going to, as it always is, that's a... That is a real challenge too. So that's what that lab is tasked to look at in more detail, right? And like you said- And I love that from a design side too, because that has always been a concern for us in terms of, you know, design integrity, you know, and for us, it was, we would design something and and we were really worried about putting our files out there because the printers are so, you know, inconsistent. So now you really have like, is the design even going to be stable? Is it even going to work? Is it, you know, going to be worthwhile someone buying that? On the, on these face mask adjusters, the, the first batch that HP worked with Peak Sports in doing their design, it has written in Chinese, let's go to war together, right? Which is suitable for giving to hospitals in Wuhan. It doesn't work so well if you don't speak Chinese. And that, that, that uh, motto may not translate well into all languages. And so when we made them in Singapore, we changed the file. It now says SG United, which is Singapore United, which is the country's rallying cry. And, you know, it's it's damn easy to change. And it's not the same. Boston strong, right, Tom? (laughs) There you go, back to, (laughs) that's what you ought to send to Beth Deakness. (laughs) They're uh, comfortable with that one. (laughs) I I, I sent some to my sister in the UK who runs a medical center in the UK and it has the name of the medical center on it. So these files can be very easy to, to, um, to modify and then how do you make sure you you have protected the design of your liability as a company yeah so i want to just talk a little bit about the de, de- uh carbonization mm. because i mean there's been some i'm going to say uh estimates out there that there's one third ca- of carbon emissions carbon emissions are related to manufacturing mm-hmm. you know what's 3d imp- 3d 
printing's impact going to be on that? Do we do we have any estimates? Do we have any ideas? I, and I, how long? Uh, I I don't know myself what the estimates may be of that potential impact. We're going to have to. I mean, if you ship if you ship a printer without some key parts, because they're going to be the local parts, they're going to make a difference to differentiate for the customer in the region, right? This may, 3D print may not help that much because the printer is the same size, it just has some parts missing. However, um, the more you can make your, your inventory near the customer very flexible by having it more vanilla, the fewer wrong SKUs you're going to ship from the central location, the more flexible your inventory will be. So inventory will go down, which companies want, but also the amount of rubbish that's inevitably going to be scrapped, shipped across the ocean, uh, will, will go down. If you, if you look at the printing world, uh, I think it's, I forget the number, it's like one third of all books printed are pulped. Oh, God, are pulped. breaking my heart. Yeah. But yes, I believe that's probably the case, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so the, the, the better you can be, the better the quality, the more likely it is you can do more and more and more of the product locally. But products are complicated. They have printed circuits, they have light emitting diodes, they have motors, they have belts, they have uh, encoder strips. So you know where the print head is on the printer. It's very complex, okay? But the better 3D gets, the more chance there is that we can reduce this. And certainly, I think there's big opportunities in inventory reduction that will start to reduce the carbon footprint. Yeah, I, I think there's still a challenge, though, in, uh, you know, long-term durability. So when I was working at Herman Miller early on, and mm. this was, you know, uh, mid-90s, and we were just putting in drivers into their sustainability programs and looking at the three, you know, the green design a aspect of things and, you know, cradle to grave and, mm -hmm. uh, and or renewal was a really big part of that. And, and we don't... Um, Herman Miller was always really proud, like, and I'm, I'm sitting in one right now, an Aaron chair that, you know, it, this is 25 years old. And so the products last a long time, and that's something that our materials really need to get up to standard on. Yes, I, 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 I think you're right, Tracy. Um, and one of the things I like about our 3D process in HP is that the parts have equivalent strength and durability to something that is, if it's today injection molded, then our products are, the durability is just as good uh, as those are. Um, the surface finish, because it's printed on powder, isn't as glossy and reflective as it can be in injection molding. So they're more used for internal parts, but you can do chemical polishing, you can do, you can paint them, to give them an, an equivalent stuff. Is I think us brand us branding people need to work a little harder on the uh, consumers to get them accept matte finish. I think uh, Elon Musk might be helping us with that in the in the latest Tesla. Yes, it's all oh, matte finish, right? Yeah. If matte finish becomes uh, quality and desirable, we'll be Absolutely. we'll be all set, right? It, it, it acquires a patina over life, which is unique to the user. <laughs> That's right. That's what we'll call it. <laughs> well, so, you know, this, we've been talking about Industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. I think Industry 4.0 is more what, what we've been talking about with Ed, Ed Davis and others. And I just think that the, the benefits to sustainable production, to empowering people local, um, to new economic opportunities, including what we're going to talk about in a, in a couple of future episodes as we move forward into, you know, jobs and, and growth in jobs and you know, thinking about all the different jobs that may be possible. And one of the statistics that um, was given to us was 65% of children entering primary school, and we have one who's going to go into first grade in the fall, entering primary school will ultimately end up working in completely new jobs that don't exist yet. And yes. I love that, actually. I don't, it's not, it doesn't scare me. I think yes. that's amazing. Yes, it's, it's exciting, and, but we are relying on education systems in the world to help prepare kids for that world. And that's, that's really, really important. So both as you guys are designers to learn or not learn that, well, you have to learn the old ways and the new ways of how products are made to be able to be, to be flexible. And uh, you know, the, the skills that people have to uh, acquire may well be different. So I think everyone's learning now how to do, how to connect remotely, right? Which will, which will be, a big help in uh, a lot of jobs, not necessarily all of them. 
Um, oh, well, our, our six-year-old certainly learned Zoom. Uh, she's got it backwards and forwards there already you go. now. So, there you go. Yeah, so she's, um, I mean, way before I expected it, seeing she can't completely read yet. So yeah, we're, we're on a good path. But you know what I think is the most interesting, and I want to say this, Nicholas, is that for a guy who's in operations mm -hmm. and manufacturing is going to be completely different, really, that's hard to plan for. And that's hard to think about how you're, you're building factories for the future or you're building manufacturing processes for the future when you don't even know what those future jobs are going to be yet or there's future lines are going to look like yeah it is it is um it is challenging uh i think covid has made it even worse because it's extremely difficult to understand um how supply lines are going to be affected what products are going to be needed whether there's going to be another wave of this but you know this kind of thing is going to happen again and again probably so we better um become good at it and you know to, to some extent uh, as a manufacturing guy, this could be a terrifying prospect for me. <laughs> but I would or much, an opportunity. <laughs> I'd rather be involved in helping to create it than waiting at the end to be affected by it, because there will be lots of uh, opportunities that uh, that you see. I mean, this whole uh, thing of digital inventory, right? For us. When you buy one of our large printers, you got to, we have to support it for, I know, five or more years after the last product is sold, not after we stop making the product after the last product is sold, which can be much later on. And the spare parts that you have to have, they're going to be needed in ever small quantities, obviously. And so you have a big economy of scale issue. You can't fire up a mold just to print 10 more parts. Um, and so have it, and so you end up with lifetime buys, which is a big bet because you can't run out, but neither do you want to have too many. So that's an impossible calculation. We, we've dealt with that in furniture a lot. <laughs> so we yeah. absolutely know. Exactly. When we do that. So the more you can uh, digitalize your spare parts and print them where you need them, that is opportunity for people in those locations to be involved in an activity where they add value where we have less inventory, where there's less carbon emitted, where there's less waste, because we don't end up throwing away a bunch of spare parts or scrapping them um, at the end of the support life of the product. So that is a, a big opportunity. And you know, things will change. Uh, increasingly in our products, we have more bridge parts in the early phase of production where the part is 3D printed. And that avoids us having to iterate a plastic mold, which is expensive and wasteful. And when we're sure that that's exactly the right configuration for the part, then it gets made into an injection mold if the volumes are sufficient. And so that industry, tool making may go down, but 3D printing may come up. So that ability for people to switch from one skill to another skill and to enable that, those parts to be equivalent to the injection molded parts that follow them and to be the same, as Tom mentioned, all over the world is really, really critical. And so standards, of how we do that, I think are still evolving and need to be a lot stronger. Mm. Well, Nicholas, I can't thank you enough for coming on and talking with us today. I mean, this is just fascinating. We could go on forever talking about 3D manufacturing sustainability, but you know, it's it's so wonderful to see uh, um, a company and a man like you who is in that who then that position who sees that bigger picture of of, of the future and is planning for that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here and to talk to you guys. Thank you. Wow. I mean, you know, hitting some hot spots for us, Tom, like some things that really matter. And so, you know, I think that, that as he was talking and I'm thinking about all these shifts in manufacturing, what's going on and that there are certain people over, over the years that are awake, like they're awake and watching what's going on. Like they're, they're noticing this shift and they're paying attention to this change. And I can say, because I, you know, used to live up in Rochester, New York with Kodak, right? And you think about Kodak and Xerox and all of that, and they were not paying attention to the shifts, right? They did not want to change when the world changed around them. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you have a company that's looking at, okay, here's what happened in D in 2D and we were a part of that change and now 3D is coming in and we're going to be a part of that change. Like that's a great mindset to begin with, but company mission as a whole that filters down to even the operations level that 
is probably the most resistant normally to change. So I think that's just fascinating. And you know what it got me thinking about? It's got me thinking about that movie, Hidden Figures, which I absolutely love. Right. And I love the character who is in the is the manager of the of the um, computers they call them right well, the, the human the, computers the human computers the right yeah yes. and she's watching this IBM <laughs> big big machine come in and yeah. she's like we're all going to be out of work and so what does she do she goes and teaches how to code right and her name actually them. was Dorothy Vaughn Dorothy Vaughn thank you and she did instead of seeing this as well she i think she did see it as a threat but at the same time she took it as an opportunity and not only solidified her own job and career in nasa but also a whole lot of jobs of of many other people she took along with her right and and that, that's what i think we need to ha see happening here and that's what i think you know, Nicholas was pointing out that they're looking at, they're sort of seeing, you know, what's going on, being the canaries out there for everybody going, yeah, here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. Here's the jobs we're going to need. Here's the education shifts we're going to need. And the ecosystem is starting to build up. And as you listen to more episodes in the series, um, especially as we start to talk about education and we start to talk about design and software and other things, you're going to see how they're laying the groundwork to actually accommodate this and make it happen and make it more smooth through the process. So, so they're being our Dorothy Vaughn in that, in that way, well, and are. that's and, fantastic. You know, Tracy, I hadn't really thought about it until you used the Kodak example. And, and it is one that you and I in particular have been very well aware of over the course of our careers. And we've seen a lot of other companies we've worked with that are not that large resist changes that really and and that resistance to change ended up being a lot of companies undoing and I, I think Kodak is a great example they actually invented digital photography and they could have owned that market and embraced it but instead they were trying to protect film production and the rest of the world innovated around them and where is Kodak today I mean you hardly ever hear about them so refreshing to see a company like HP with a, a its own kind of history embrace 3d and and making it something completely new and sustainable and uh, that making the future so exciting for not only for them as a company but for the rest of us as well I, i'm Absolutely. I, you know it, it really it well, shows you how impressive it, it, it's not just that old an example i mean we've been working with retailers right and you look at the retailers and and the same things are happening or you know we worked with many furniture companies as we've mentioned over the episode and a lot of those furniture companies are completely gone and out of business because they didn't want to shift to online uh, to supporting the online sales and having amazon as a client they just wanted to stay with the big box stores and ship container loads right yeah and how and so, well is everybody doing selling through big box stores now in you know with with the situation in COVID-19 I mean people are afraid to go buy in stores so right. that isn't such a safe bet anymore right so you know and this is this is the shifts that we're talking about and, and if you're going to make a sustainable business if you're going to be uh, sustainable in helping the environment and helping move the uh, economies through and making a sustainable economy, like all of sustainable jobs for our future, right? That, that word sustainable is a very strong and broad defined word. And I love that we, we, you know, Nicholas really helped us define that in a really broad way here. Nicholas Smith and what they're doing at HP, the mindset of flexibility, of vision on the future, and wanting to be a part of that future is phenomenal. Not only wanting to be a part of it, but I believe seeing the opportunities that it presents. I mean, it's so exciting. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that interview. And I really hope all of you did too. This was, this was different uh, yeah. than a lot of episodes we do, but in a, in a really very good way. Yeah. So, well, we have so many episodes in the series that we're excited about. Like this is just a, you know, a tipping point. We're early on in the, in the series. So I hope you're going to join us for all of them. And um, we have the whole series laid out as they, as the new episodes launch. Um, so if you're finding this after they're all launched, they're all laid out on the website page, 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP. And of course, all the blog posts for this episode, including that video that um, Tom had, um, had him showing the little pieces of mask holders. That's the best way to call I, them. The yeah. 
the yeah, mask holders I, I and the swabs. The actual name he used, but but some of these parts that they've made in the HP multi-jet fusion printers, you really can't see it on the video. So you you want to go check that out if you're listening. And we'll do a little podcast. short clip of it too within the blog post, so you can just jump right to that if you've already like heard the whole episode, so you don't have to skip through it and try to find it. So we'll make sure that that happens there, and uh, you know and the, all those things and all of the series, everything's at 3dstartpoint.com. So you're gonna be able to find them. There's images and resources and all kinds of other things. And you know, one of the things that they have is they have an, uh, uh, an HP sustainability impact report and they have put that as, the, as a link to at the bottom of the episode as well. So that's both on the um, forward slash HP page as well as at the blog post. So you'll be able to get that, download it and read some more about this, their, their sustainability impact that they're having um, around the world and what they're trying to do and, and, and their mission and goals for the future. So there's a lot of information in there. Uh, so everyone, I hope you've been enjoying the series already as much as we are. And I really hope you're going to join us for the rest of it because it's all, it's got a lot of great data and interesting people that we're going to introduce you to that you've probably never heard of or heard from before. Yeah. Lots more to come. So <laughs> stay tuned. So we'll see you next time on the next episode of WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard. And I'm Tracy Hazard. Thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.